Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Peggy Javery, and I'm serving as your moderator for this session, and it's 108. And you are attending Why We Need a Cruel Accounting in Washington. I have the pri privilege to introduce our speaker, and it is the Honorable Joseph J. Diaguardi, who served for 22 years, 12 of them as a partner with the international accounting firm of Arthur Anderson and Company, the first public advocate for financial accountability in government. In January 1985, he brought his extensive professional experience to Capitol Hill when he became the first practicing certified public accountant to serve in U.S. Congress. And as a member of the House, Dio Guardi took the lead in sounding the call for truth in federal budgeting, accounting, and reporting, and in bringing financial accountability to Capitol Hill. He was the original author of the Chief Financial Officer Act, signed by President George H.W. Bush in 1990, which mandated the assignment of a CFO to each major department and agency of the U.S. government. He has many uh, accomplishments. He also established Truth in Government, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization to continue his mission for federal accounting and budget reforms. He talks about his book, and so hopefully everyone got a chance to uh, pick up a book that he's written here on Accountable Congress. It doesn't add up, and he's also given us numerous articles to also read. He is a recipient of many awards and honors for his achievement as a professional accountant. He was given the Outstanding CPA and Government Award by the New York State Society of CPAs in 1986 and in 1992. He received the Association of Government Accountants Annual Achievement Award in Boston, Massachusetts. So he's affiliated with AGA. He's uh, been a keynote speaker at many of the events and training programs. He was born in Bronx, New York, and I'm not going to hey. put your date. I'm not going to put your Anybody date. Anybody here from the Bronx? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Dear Guardi moved to Winchester County with his uh, immigrant parents in 1957. He is a 1958 graduate of Fordham Pepper Preparatory School, and in 1962, he graduated with honors from Fordham. Uh, university. Without further ado, please uh, give him a warm welcome as he comes to tell us. Thank you. About our Thank you. Thank you. Both those institutions were in the Bronx, as was my father's food market, and that's where I was raised. And what does that tell you? The story of America, that you can be anybody, do anything you want if you dream about it, work hard, and basically that's the road that I, I endured with my tough father who came off the boat in 1929, believe it or not, right in the middle of the Depression from a poor farming village in Italy. I like to tell that story because that's what America is all about, okay? So let me begin by, does everybody have a copy of the book now? Okay? Why did I bring that book? In fact, I'm going to come down here because pretty soon I'm going to have to point to this, but I'm going to leave a few of these things there and pick them up later. When I left Congress in 1989, I was kind of the accidental congressman. I went to a district that had three times the number of people in a different party. You don't have to know my party. Party shouldn't count anymore in America. They didn't count for me back then because I wasn't intimidated by the fact that there were three to one against me. But I decided to run and I was allowed to run because if my party thought I could win, they wouldn't put me up. They would have put up some political hack who was probably the vice chairman of the party. Oh, it's her turn, not yours. But it didn't work because they didn't know until the last minute that I had a chance to win that. And I won it by 1,000 votes out of 300,000 on election day. That was the best poll of all. I managed to stay there two terms. Not easy in that district. But when I left, I felt I did not yet complete my congressional agenda. So in 1989, I started a nonprofit organization, a watchdog, called Truth in Government. There it is. Look at that card, the national debt card. 
Now, you know those are young people because you see one has a ponytail, all right? That's been my logo ever since I got into Congress. Because in 1985, when I realized that we were going to have a $200 billion deficit, doesn't sound like a lot these days, does it? Even under Ronald Reagan, I was upset. But a lot of people were upset. That's why they had this Graham Rudman's howlings, we got to reduce the deficit 25% a year till it goes down to nothing. Didn't work. They tried. They got it down. But then they realized they wouldn't get it down in four years. They then made it seven. Then they quit. So when I got out, I said, you know, I've got to continue this message. It's too important. If it was important then, think about it today when you're dealing with four years in a row of trillion dollar deficits. I think last year it went down to 800 billion. This year they're gonna, I think, project in the fiscal year, September 30th, 2014, 600 and something billion. It's kind of outrageous. And what's the message that I had then that I have now? We're spending money we don't have, we're borrowing from countries we don't trust, and we're giving up that American dream that brought my dad here in 1929, and my mother too. I think that's bad for America. Now, I had, believe it or not, a whiteboard animation. I raised money through the foundation, through friends. This is a volunteer thing for me, and I thought I was gonna give you the benefit of seeing it for the first time before it goes out. And I find out we're not hooked up to the internet. So while there's a hyperlink embedded, you'll see little Johnny, it could be little Mary, uh, I can't, but I'll describe to you what I'm trying to do. Because I didn't come here to teach you anything. What can I teach you? Your accountants. You know accrual accounting. You know about auditing, financial management, financial reporting. No. I just want to tell you that you are also something else that's more important besides an accountant. You're an informed citizen, and I'm sure you're concerned because you just filled up this room. Okay? And that's why I wanted to come here. I wrote an article that was in the AGA Journal. You probably read it. It was preceded by a little thing I put on perspectives. Why federal accounting? In that version, I think I say why we need federal accounting in Washington. But if you look at the little book that I gave you, and you see the articles I published in Huffington Post, Roll Call, The Hill, I came up with outrageous articles. Like, without accrual accounting, America is finished. I do believe that. Why is that important? This is not an accounting exercise. This is not an academic issue. This is telling the truth. Telling the truth to the people today paying taxes and certainly the people today that are not even voting or not even born. We're spending their money. Where do you think this money's coming from? This national debt that's being run up. So I felt I had to now, blessed by being a CPA, 22 years in a profession, four years in Congress, and now 20 years as a public advocate, as a volunteer, I do other things to make a living, but this is where I spend most of my time. I felt it was important to energize you as concerned citizens to maybe make a call or send an email to your representative and say, I heard this guy, Joe DiAguardi. Hey, by the way, they won't be surprised because they hear from me a lot. They're tired of hearing from me because I haven't changed my message one bit in 30 years. And now my message is being validated by the fact that it's gotten so much more worse than what it was. And you know, when I got to Congress, in order to make the point, I took my voting card out. You ever seen a congressman's voting card? It's a plastic card because we have a computer terminal at the end of the row of seats. And I said to myself one day, hey, this is not just a voting card, it's a credit card. Because every time I put it into the terminal, I'm raising the national debt because we don't collect enough money to pay for what we're promising. So I called it the most expensive credit card in the world and it's chapter one of this book. This book was written in 1990 and 91, published in 1992 nationally. Uh, I put in, in 2010, when we issued the book again, a new introduction, but I didn't change the other chapters. So I wanted you to see this because even though the numbers are different, the message is the same. But there's another reason why I wanted you to have this book today. Look at, if you read nothing else, look at the letters I sent in 1987 in the back, in the appendix, to President Reagan, to his chief of staff, Howard Baker, and look at the response then I got from Dick Cheney, who, he, who was he? He was then the Republican chairman, the conference, the Republican conference chairman. 
And then when I answered him, look at the response I got from another CPA, the OMB director in those days, Jim Miller. And you'll see that I was concerned enough to engage these three people, first to warn them that we're heading in the wrong direction, and then when I got the response from Jim Miller that, you know, Joe, you're right, something must be done, and at the end of his letter he says to me, and I answered it very quickly, uh, very abruptly to him, he probably didn't like it, he says, Joe, if we do what you're saying, we're going to make the deficit look bigger. I said, hey, it's already bigger. You guys are papering over it. You've got to get on the right accounting system in order to show what we're really spending. Now, my letter to Howard Baker was published in the Wall Street Journal in 1987 when I had my partners in Arthur Anderson, people like my friend Bert Edwards here, and the guy we worked with, Mort Eagle, we had to work on the bailout of New York City in 1975. That was Arthur Anderson. And the point is that when I uh, called, what was the point I was just trying to make before I got diverted by print? <laughs> wait, oh. no, uh, what was that? Howard Baker. Howard Baker. Yes, I, when I got the letters to them and coming back, the whole idea was to get them excited about this topic enough that they may do something. Well, I wouldn't have written that article in the Journal of the Association of Government Accountants if something were being done or had been done. But something may be done because as a result of the research I did, there is now a resolution in the House of Representatives introduced at my urging by the new Congressional CPA Caucus. I was the first CPA. There are now 10 in the House of Representatives. That bill was introduced about accrual accounting, five pages. If you see it on my website, you'll see the draft of it that was put there before Congress put in theirs. And it's basically 80% of what I gave them, word for word. But now, how is it going to get passed? I thought my visit here might encourage you after you see the shocking websites I'm going to show you to wake you up if you're not woken up already. The need to do something as concerned citizens who happen to be accountants who are more informed than anybody else. Do I have your attention? Mm -hmm. Now, may I have a drink of water? Because <laughs> I have a little bit of an allergy and I got to make sure I do something about that. A nice little. Good. So with that, let me get in the front of this. You can see what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to capture the essence of what the problem is by putting that national debt card. And if you look at a congressman or a congresswoman's voting card, it does exist on the backs of the young people who have to be the ones to uh, pay our debt. Now, Unfortunately, you're not going to see the two and a half minute animation because we're not hooked up to the internet. There was a hyperlink that was supposed to press. Uh, I thought I had everything planned. You know, accountants like to plan everything. The one thing I didn't feel I had to do was call someone to see whether or not this would play. We're not hooked up to the internet, so it's not going to be playing. But you can see it if you go to the website, www.truthingovernment.com. I think it's on here. And it's probably in the end of my, yeah, there it is, right? And it's uh, probably in the front part of the book as well. So let me tell you what I tried to do with this. We have a whiteboard animation. Have you seen these? They're very cute. Somebody draws very quickly, and someone's speaking in a normal voice. And basically, we're talking about little Johnny or little Mary. At the end, you'll see it's male and female, uh, about what we are doing to them by not funding what we're spending today. And you'll see, see some cute things that we tried to do. This is like a $10,000 production. It had to change several times because I didn't like the first ones. I wanted to make the point once and for all. So you'll see it in the beginning how the capital, the dome opens up and dollar bills are flying out. And, and basically that's what's happening. We're spending money like water. Obviously, we're not collecting taxes for it. So what are we doing? We're borrowing for that. But then you'll see another section where you see a politician in front of a, a podium, and he's speaking, and he's promising. So you see the dome open up again, and you see bubbles coming out. I promise, I promise, I promise. Well, these are all the unfunded obligations. Medicare, 
Social Security. You got a lot of things that we're doing, promising, but we're not funding. I mean, even look at the Highway Trust Fund. People are yelling for infrastructure, but Congress refuses to even do anything to put any money in it, and that's going to be a big battle, as you're going to see in the next month or so. So in any case, go see this. In fact, if you have a mobile phone and you hook up, you'll be able to see it today, and I'd be delighted to get an email from you, uh, and anybody who wants my card, I'm going to put a whole bunch of them in the back before you leave. Just get it and email me what you think of it and what you, how, how it might improve, because everything's a work in process as far as I'm concerned, and how you might participate by any ideas you have. I think maybe I'm going to write a letter to the editor of the local paper. I think I'm going to maybe talk to the Rotary, as I just did with this animation on uh, June 26th in Manhattan, the largest Rotary in America. There are all kinds of things you can do. Okay, let's now look at this. Now, this is the forecast. Now, these are not Joe Diaguardi's numbers. These numbers are available if you know where to find them. These numbers come, and you'll see throughout this presentation, from the annual financial statement of the United States of America, the Government Accounting Office. This bunch comes from the OMB, where we have numbers coming from. No, this is Congressional Budget Office. Numbers coming from the OMB and whatnot. So let me now just quickly put on my little glasses here so that I know that I'm looking at what you're looking at. OK? All right. I gave you the actual figures for 2012. Fiscal year is September 30th and 2013. It says billions, 16, well, this is trillions, obviously, because it's 16,048 billion, so it's $16 trillion. So these are all trillions going across. And what do you have here? Let's see if this little thing works now. I think it does. Yeah, there it is. All right, so those are actual numbers. These are the projections from the Congressional Budget Office going from 2014, fiscal year, September 30th, to 24th. It's 10 years. Look at these numbers. Now, what is 17 trillion 694 billion? That is the debt that is reckoned or at least represented by US Treasury bonds, notes, bills. That's what we have to borrow in order to spend, okay? This is on the cash basis, right? Cash basis. Now, the problem is that if you take the real numbers, and we can get them. Well, they're not in the balance sheet of the statements put by, out by the GAO. They're in the footnotes. Or just below the balance sheet, we now have something called sustainability numbers. Because in 2009, I was one of the ones that testified in front of the Federal Accounting Standards Advisory Board. Do you know what FASAB is? FASAB is that group like FASB that is support, was set up to, in effect, come up with appropriate accounting principles for the federal government. GASB, JASB does it for the states. FASB, FASB does it for publicly held comp uh, traded companies. But FASAB was doing it for the federal government, and I went in front of them. If you want to see my tough testimony, how I said to them, you're in conflict, you're not independent, the Treasury has too much to say here, your members are dominated by people in the government, it should change. Well. There is a bill that was put in. I have it also, I think, in the file that I gave you to now restructure the FASAB. It already has 20 sponsors on it. Why? We want it independent of government. So now there will only be out of 10 people on that board, three from government, and the one from Treasury has no votes. There's one from GAO, one from OMB, and seven from, in effect, the financial sector. So we want to have independent thinking when it comes up with creating the accounting principles that we need for the federal government. And obviously, in my mind, it's the accrual basis of accounting, but I'm not going to be the one to now tell the FASAB what to do, but I'm sure that's what's going to happen when you have seven people from the financial sector there to talk about it. So we go on to the next slide. This is the slide that came up from the former Comptroller General, you know, David Walker. When he left, he started something called Comeback America. This is a version of what's on a building in New York City called the Debt Clock. The Debt Clock, I remember it was Seymour Durst who did that. His son still allow it on the building, but that Debt Clock on the building is on a cash basis. 
So you'll see probably 17 point something trillion. This debt clock is on the accrual basis. So as of this point in time, we're talking over 70 trillion. No one knows the exact amount, but you can be sure it's somewhere near four times the treasury bills that you saw in the other slides. Now, let's go to the next. Just to give you a sense for where we are, okay? U.S., this is now Treasury's numbers, April 2014. Look at U.S. gross domestic product, April 2014. It's $16.8 trillion. Look at the national debt just measured by Treasury bills, $17.6 trillion. So already we're at the point where the national debt just in Treasury bills and you know they have to be paid, along with the interest, God forbid you miss interest, you're in default, is now greater than the gross domestic product of the United States of America. But look at it on the accrual basis. Approximately 72 trillion is what we got. You're talking about almost four times the gross domestic product of the United States of America. Now, it's shocking, but this is still not the bad news, because if this is just government debt. I got a slide here to show you what household debt is. You wouldn't believe student loans, revolving credit, uh, credit card loans, auto loans, and what about regular mortgages? You're talking well over $17 trillion. Now, how can this country succeed if we're building our future on debt? It's hard to understand. Where are the leaders that are pointing us in the right direction? I'm not that leader. I'm here like a, I hope it's not a voice crying in the wilderness, but I'm here kind of as, a, as someone who has to warn you that this is something you have to pay attention to. Okay, now, let's look at where we are today. This is the president's proposed total spending for the fiscal year 2014. Look how it breaks down. Social Security, unemployment, labor, 33%. Medicare and health, that includes, by the way, Medicaid, another 25%. So just those two items, you have almost, what, 60%. And if you add the interest on the national debt, you're dealing with over 60%. So the rest of the government is probably somewhere around 35% because I'm going to show you another slide. So in round numbers, you can figure out that a minimum of 60% of the federal government is preordained and it may be as much as two-thirds. And the rest is there for Congress to kind of fiddle with, what are we gonna spend now that's discretionary? Because the next slide will show you, basically, mandatory spending is 64%. Mandatory, by the way, includes Medicaid. Even though Medicaid is not contracted, not funded, like Medicare, and, and that's not even funded, but not, it has no trust fund, Medicare and Social Security does, you're talking about 64% mandatory spending and only 30% discretionary spending and interest on the federal debt, which we know is going to go up. And that, that's the interest we're talking about on Treasury bills. That's 6% of the spending for the year. And the projected spending, did I give you the total on the last slide? Uh, if you, no, not here, but you'll show you. It's about $3.7 trillion for the fiscal year 2014. But you know we're not raising 3.7 trillion. Uh, this year we're projected to raise 800 billion less than that. In four prior years, we had over a trillion each year less than that, which means that money got added to the national debt. So if you look at just the last two presidents, forget about your party. If you look at Obama and you look at Bush, the combination of what they spent that they didn't collect is well over $10 trillion. That's why the national debt is out of hand, and that's not on the accrual basis. I'm talking about $10 trillion on the cash basis. Because if you go back to the book that I gave you, uh, turn to page, on the book, page seven, if you got the book. Turn to page seven. Look where we were when I wrote this book in fiscal year September 30th, 1991. Government spent $1.3 trillion, which is 24% of the gross domestic product, okay? And we took in 1.5 so that we had a deficit, 
and we knew that deficit was $269 billion. I just wanted to show you how big, you might say, well, how could we go on the cash basis, treasury bills, from $1.323 trillion to $17 trillion? Well, I just told you, two presidents and two uh, administrations, uh, four years of Obama, President Obama, and eight years of President Bush alone in excess of $10 trillion was spent. And some say that does not count the cost of the two wars, which were off the books to begin with. And I'm not even sure what those numbers are, because we don't have independent audits that tell us everything. We have audits. In fact, let me show you the book. I brought it with me. Here it is. I just read it once again, 246 pages. These are the financial statements of the United States of America for the fiscal year, September 30th, 2013. You're aware that we have this. But you should also be aware that the Comptroller General, I think it's page 26 of the book, says we can't issue an opinion. Forget about a clean opinion. He can't issue an opinion and doesn't think he can issue an opinion until the fiscal year 2017. And we've been doing this since 2004. And by the way, we're doing this as a result of the bill I put in, in back then that got passed in 1990, that we need annual financial statements. But my bill called for accrual accounting. But when they passed the bill, I wasn't there. I had left the year before. They came up, instead of with generally accepted accounting principles, look what the politicians did. They put in acceptable accounting principles for the federal government. So, you know, and we're still there today. Now we'll see what the FASAB does with their new incarnation. And by the way, one of the reasons we had to do that was to get them better funding. They were not funded enough. And if we're going to be serious about doing something, you've got to pay to get the job done. And that's a very serious thing as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so let's just go to the next slide here. We pass that, mandatory. Now, interest costs. You know, I did a speech at uh, the Wharton School. They brought together several different disciplines, accounting, political economy, economics, in a big hall. And guess what I put up as the beginning of my slide presentation? A bomb with a fuse. And I called it the debt bomb. And that's really, I should have put that back, because we do have a debt bomb in America. What's the fuse? Interest. Interest is going up. Did you read the papers last week? They finally admitted they're not gonna buy any more treasury bills because we gotta get the economy back on a real basis. We've had an artificial monetary, well, let's put it this way. We've had an artificial rate of interest now for well over four years, maybe six, because fiscal policy didn't work. Congress is doing nothing. So the Fed had to jump in. What's fiscal policy? What do I collect in taxes? What do I spend? What's monetary policy? What's the size of the monetary, uh, the money supply? What's the interest rate? So the Fed had to step in, otherwise we'd have a huge depression in 2008, 2009, and 2010. The key now is, how do you get us off this cocaine, which is free money, printing money. This is what's going on. It's easy to print money you don't have, and that's what we've done. So, and we don't even have an order of the Fed, and they say the Fed has a balance sheet of somewhere between four and five trillion dollars. So we gotta understand what's going on in that black box as well. But here's 2014, look at the numbers. Let me put this back on here. Now, where are we? Interest goes through the roof. This is from 2014 to 2024, CBO numbers. So here we have the first year of interest. This is now 6.6% uh, .6 of the spending for that year. So 2014, on a slide before you saw it was round number six. That was the Congressional Budget Office. OMB is saying that it's gonna be six 0.6%, okay? So we have 6.6% of the projected spending of $3.7 trillion going to interest. But look how that number goes up. And this is based on current law and the fact that things won't change. And the way we see Congress acting, things are not gonna change until we really get into a crisis. It seems like the only way we get things changed in America is we gotta be really in a deep crisis, everybody wakes up. Which, which is what we did in 1987. Remember the SNL bailout? I was there at the time. It was terrible. Finally, they had to deal with it, and they had to come up with $500 billion to bail out the SNLs. But typical of Congress, they left some in place. They called them zombie thrifts, because some people lobbied that they wanted them in place, mainly P. 
people who were attorneys who wanted to milk these thrifts of more fees, and that money came out of the federal government. I hate to sound so cynical, but it's in my book. Read that, that chapter on what we did with the SNL crisis. Now, okay, so you got these numbers, 6.6, 7.1, 8.1, 2024, 14% plus of the spending is projected to go just for interest. Now, if mandatory spending stays the same, that's got to come out of discretionary spending. What's that? Education, defense, things that you need, things that the United States needs to live on, succeed. Infrastructure. Infrastructure is not mandatory. It should be the way it's collapsing right now, bridges and whatnot. Okay. Now, what's this? This is in that little whiteboard animation, but I'm going to show, just explain what I try to do. I realized when I got to Congress that most people cannot read a profit and loss statement. Why? Most people don't have stocks. They invest in mutual funds or money market instruments, so they don't get any more P&Ls, you know, a balance sheet or a financial statement. So I put the entire budget of the United States of America, it's in the book, but I updated it for this presentation for this year. You have it in the book as of 1991. This is now the year, fiscal year 2013. And I said, what's the accrued liability debt at the beginning of the year? And we know what that is. That's that 72 trillion, approximately. Let's say 70 trillion. I divided that number by the number of taxpayers in America. Now, how many people live in America today? Man, woman, child, 315 million people. But how many taxpayers do we have? I got from the IRS, who filed 1040s last year? Even easy. 1040s, the EZ or whatever they call it, uh, 136 million. So I divided 70 trillion plus, the actual numbers at the bottom, by the number of taxpayers to get a number at the beginning of the year, 513,962. So that's what you as a taxpayer have on your head at the beginning of the year. Now what happened during the year? Well, on a cash basis now, I took the major departments, Health and Human Services, what's that? Medicare and Medicaid. So 6,558 is your share of what we spent last year on that. That's that 136 divided into the, the number. And then go down, Social Security, so you can see the big ones. Again, our Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. Then the Department of Defense, 4,227. Veterans Affairs, I have it in descending order, and then I put um, other miscellaneous 728. Well, what's the next thing? Well, you paid something. So I then divided 136 million into what you paid for income taxes, corporate taxes, I had to attribute that to you, estate taxes, excise taxes, and what's that? That's right there, payments received, there's your share. Income taxes, 9,619. Social security taxes, boy, that's a big one. You know, it was supposed to go into the trust fund, but you know what happens with social security taxes, they put it right in the general fund. And they have a kind of a notebook that they keep, that what they owe to the Social Security Trust Fund. And yet, politicians had the nerve to tell you that this was a lockbox. This was a trust fund. This is sacred money, would never be touched. It's spent as fast as it comes in. And then we put a little note on the books, what we have to pay back, okay? And by the way, of the $17 trillion, $5 trillion is in the Social Security Trust Fund. We don't pay the interest today, but we accrue that interest because it's got to be paid out when the benefits are paid out. In the past, we didn't worry too much about it, but why are we worried today? The baby boomers, they're coming on fast and they want their benefits now, and that interest has to be paid now. So everything is accelerating. So it's important to understand this. I wonder whether our legislators understand it. That's the issue. So you add up all these things, and by the way, look at the finance charge, what's that? That's your share of the interest on the national debt, and there it is. 2,922 was paid out on average for you as a taxpayer last year. If you add up those numbers, the national debt goes per person from 513 to, six, to $520,000 a person. I'm trying to make it easy for people to understand that this is not just something up in the sky. This does pertain to you. And every kid that's born today has that number on their head as a national mortgage, it's a national debt mortgage. Besides the debt that their parents have. 
And let's go to that. It's coming. Big debt on campus. Okay, I put this in here just as an example. And my good friend Bert Edwards told me, Joe, that slide is already obsolete over here. And he sends me a memo, and sure enough, because he worked in the government after going out of, what was that big title you had? You were deputy C CFO? CFO, not deputy, CFO of state. Of, of state, wow. So he, he knows how it works. And he's still here, he didn't walk out. So he, he must agree. <laughs> the point is, he sends me a memo that the number as of April of this year for student debt is a trillion, three hundred billion dollars. Now, a trillion, three hundred billion dollars that is being borrowed by young people, backed up by their families. And you know what they did? If you go into bankruptcy, you can't get rid of student debt. Are you aware of that? If you're on Social Security and you still have student debt outstanding, the Social Security deducts it. They deduct it from your Social Security. If you have a tax refund coming and you haven't paid off your debt, it comes out of your tax refund first. What signal are we sending to these kids? And think about it. And one thing that I think you and I discussed, Bert, is that if you looked at that number, a trillion, 300 billion, probably half of it is never going to be collected. And yes, that's not on the books because we're on a cash basis. If this were a bank that was lending money and you were on the accrual basis, you'd be indicted for securities fraud if you didn't <coughs> estimate what it was that you were not going to collect. Am I right? You know it. Insurance companies, we're a big insurer of a lot of things. They have to estimate each year what is going to be our loss reserve. And in some cases, in most cases, I think the states force them to put that cash aside. We don't do that in the United States. On the accrual basis, that's national debt. Okay, but look at this. It went from, in 19, uh, 2003, uh, approximately 250 billion to where this slide says, almost a trillion in, in 2013, and now 2014, April, it's a trillion, $300 billion. Now, just talk about other debt. Look at this, student loan debt has gone from 2003 to 2012, past debts on cars, debts on credit cards, and revolving home equity loans. But every one of them is kind of up there. And what does this not have? your regular mortgages. Now you might say, well, our house is worth something. Yes, it, it is, but there are a lot of houses that I'll bet today are underwater, and we don't know that the debts that are re represented by those mortgages are backed up by assets 100%. There's probably some slippage there as well. So I'm just showing you this for effect. It's not just the national debt we have to be concerned about. We are pushing debt in every possible way. And who's doing it? Well, there must be some special interest group that's making money on interest. Maybe it's Wall Street, I don't know, think about it. Somebody's pushing us to live on debt, not on productive work where you get paid. You know, my father bought us a house. That's how I became a congressman in, 19, uh, in, in, in Westchester County. We moved there in 1957, I was 16. I had to go with my father, with his car, around all the banks in the Bronx to take the cashier's checks. He was saving his money from 1929. He would not take a mortgage. He paid for the house with cashier's checks, almost 30,000, okay? Now, that's outrageous today. I wouldn't suggest doing that. But at least have a 20% down payment or a 10% down payment. We had these no doc loans before. We had no down payment loans before. Come on, give me a break. Let's get back to reality. You know, we need to have value. How do you build a value in America? You can't do it by just borrowing because sooner or later, the interest and the penalties on that interest if you don't pay for it, like many kids in school with credit cards, is gonna eat you up alive. And that could happen with the national debt. If that interest keeps going the way it is, and we don't have a Congress and a president that works together to understand that we gotta really grow our way out of this, somewhere along the line, I, I hesitate to use the word bankruptcy or default, but what, what's gonna happen? we're gonna become unsustainable. You know what unsustainable is? That means we're on a path in the wrong direction, and even if we don't go bankrupt, somebody's gonna pass us, like China, or Japan, or Germany, so that we're not gonna be the number one superpower anymore. And can we trust a quasi-communist, quasi-capitalist state like China to be number one in the world these days, or in the next 10 years? I doubt it. This is what's at stake. 
Do we see far enough ahead on this? Okay. Now, why accrual accounting? And that's what we're here for. When I did the article for the Association of Government Accountants, I decided to go back to get a really good understanding of why we're not on the accrual basis. And what do I find? For 60 years, read the article. It's in that little book I gave, the booklet. Good people, important people, four presidents have called for the accrual basis of accounting, starting with Truman, the first Hoover Commission, 1949. Truman signed it and called for accrual accounting. The second one was President Eisenhower. Not only signed it and called for it, he forced a public law, 84-863, in 1956, saying we need accrual accounting and it must be implemented within, I think it was a five-year period or some reasonable time. Nobody acted on it. Now, I wrote an article. If you look at my website, you'll see 100 articles I've written in the last 20 years. The book only has maybe a dozen in the last few years. But one of them was in 2013 because a lawyer called me. He says, Joe, you can't be right. You're telling me there's a law on the books for accrual accounting? I said, listen, you have a national law journal. You're the National Bar Association or the American Bar Association. Why don't you authorize me to write an article so that your people would then research it and vet it? It happened, 2003, National Law Journal, 30,000 uh, attorneys read it. They didn't change one word and that site is in there. So we had a law on the books that Congress just said, hey, we're not going to do it. They didn't tell you about it. They didn't advertise it, but they did nothing. Just like today, they can do nothing if they want. Now, President Lyndon Johnson, though, picked it up because he had a presidential commission on budgeting, 1967, and he said, we need accrual accounting. And then who picked it up after he resigned? Nixon. But you know what happened to Nixon? He didn't last, so he couldn't push it. But I then was told, Joe, if you really want to see why you're right, and why Nixon couldn't do much, go into the Congressional Research Service, the Library of Congress, but you need to get into the papers of Caspar um, Weinberger. Caspar Weinberger was a very important player in those days. In, um, what was his title in those days? I think he was uh, OMB, not an OMB director, but he had a lot to do with, with, with the finances. And Caspar um, Weinberger, pages and pages, reams, of, of documents, but I had to get permission of the family to open up those archives, and I did. So I went to the Congressional Research Service, and what I got was better than I expected, tremendous correspondence between Weinberger, Johnson, uh, Weinberger and Nixon, and guess who? Elmer Statz, probably the best controller general we ever had, Elmer Statz. And he said, we absolutely need this, we have to push for it. But these things have been buried in the archives in the Congressional Research Service. But I just want you to know, every Comptroller General of the United States has called for it. Four presidents have called for it. And by the way, my old accounting firm that did the bailout of New York City when, when President Ford, maybe you, you didn't remember the front page of the Daily News, dropped dead New York. No one's about to bail out New York. But Arthur Anderson was called in by Felix Rowayton, Lazard Frez, hey, we need to come up with a statement we can understand. We don't understand. They have no financial statements here. As it was, they had no books either. So Anderson, for one year, put a bunch of partners. I was kind of on the periphery as a tax partner. And they had to piece together the financial affairs of New York City and came up with conventional profit and loss and, and, and financial statements, a balance sheet, that Lazard Frears could work with. And remember the answer? It was the Municipal Assistance Corporation, Big Mac, MAC, Municipal Assistance Corporation. It was kind of a wraparound mortgage allowing New York City to issue new bonds, but there had to be a revenue stream to back it up, so therefore a lot of money had to come out to the, from the pension funds to make that, but there was enough money in the pension funds to do it. Greece could not do that today, by the way. They already raided their pension funds. In those days, New York City had a lot of money that was not unencumbered in the pension funds. The point is that we got such experience on that, the head of Arthur Anderson in those days, Harvey Kaepernick, said, would it be nice if you guys now did the same for the United States of America? That's a pretty big job. You know how many pieces? How many, you got agencies, departments, you've got other things off the books, you've had all kinds of uh, uh, what they call enterprise funds, but it, we did it. And we came up with the first prototype statement 
I brought the book with me here. Arthur Anderson issued it in a little booklet called uh, The Need for Fiscal Responsibility in the Public Sector. And in the back of the book were these statements. Well, those statements were the beginning of the statements you have today. The firm did it on their nickel until 1982, and then they passed it on to the Treasury Department. Now, guess what the Treasury Department did as soon as they got it? Who can guess? They took the liability for Social Security off the balance sheet. They put it in a footnote. So now you know where their heads were at. They didn't want statements on the accrual basis. They wanted statements that the lawmakers could say they could live with. And that's the problem today. Everybody wants to live with something, but what we're living with is not enough, not for this great country, and that's why I wrote that article. Now, here's Public Law 84, 84, 863, 1956. As soon as practicable, the head of each executive agency shall, in accordance with the principles and standards prescribed by the Controller General, cause the accounts of such agency to be maintained on the, am I reading it right, accrual basis to show the resources, liabilities, and costs of operations of such agency with a view to facilitating the preparation of cost-based budgets. There it is. Then, Arthur Anderson, after it prepared these statements from 1975 to 1982, and I left in 1984, I, ran, I just left the firm at that point, no one ever, had ever done that, leave an accounting firm to run for Congress. It was 1986, they put out a booklet, Sound Financial Reporting in the U.S government and Arthur Anderson, what did they say here? And this, I cherish these words. These words are magnificent, okay? Read them. At its core, the cash basis system of accounting, a system which records financial transactions when income is received and expenses are paid, is a faulty way of measuring the government's financial condition and cost of operations. Now, look at what I underlined. Elected officials in Washington are accustomed to cash basis accounting because it provides them with the advantage of currying favors with favor with today's voters at the expense of tomorrow's taxpayers. It's exactly what's going on today. They want votes, they want to get elected, they don't want to give the bad news. Accrual accounting gives you the bad news. That's the message I got in my book when you read OMB directors. They were not prepared to give the public bad news. That was the year to do it, back in 1987. We could have handled it back then. Now it's humongous. It's going to be really difficult to do this because people are going to wake up and say, why did you wait all these years to tell us that the real debt is 74 trillion and not 17? But at some point, they're going to have to come clean. I hate to talk like I'm from the Bronx, but that's basically what it is. They're going to have to come clean. They're going to have to tell the truth. Now, I give you the Medicaid example. Why? We hear the Affordable Care Act. People call it Obamacare. But it's the Affordable Care Act. What I didn't know until I went through the research is that actuaries compute the liability for Social Security and Medicare on a 75-year horizon. And that number is in this book. When you look at the balance sheet in this book, look just below the balance sheet. It's called sustainability numbers. That's what we managed to get the FASAB to do in 2009. Sustainability. They were afraid to put it on the balance sheet, but in here, you'll see a combination of Social Security and Medicare adding up to about $38 trillion, almost $40 trillion. It's in there. It's on the same page as the balance sheet, but it's not on the balance sheet. It's just below it. What's on the balance sheet is not the $17 trillion. They refuse to put that on even. They put $12 trillion. The five that's in the Social Security Trust Fund, they got the nerve to tell you when I asked this question, oh, we don't have to put that on because under consolidation, we offset the trust fund against the liability. I said, you gotta be kidding me. There's nothing in that trust fund. That's an imputed reserve. Now they're reconsidering it and they're thinking next year, maybe they're gonna put the full 17 on the balance sheet. But it's 17, but there's still something missing because we have federal pensions that are not funded, even congressional pensions. Veterans benefits. We have pensions, liabilities that we have to pay. They're on the balance sheet. You'll see them. About six trillion dollars. They're not funded, so they're there. So add up 17 and six and 38, and then there's other things. You get to your 70 trillion dollars. Okay. I just wanted to tell you that one of the things that I found out by accident was that the group that computes the reserves 
you know, actuaries are called in by General Motors, General Electric. They got to put these numbers on their balance sheets, otherwise their board gets indicted for securities fraud. So every balance sheet of every major corporation has an actuarial computation in conjunction with the accountants for what is owed, even though it's not funded. You got to put it there where we can see it. Well, we do it now in a sustainability for Social Security and Medicare. But guess what I didn't know? That's why I told you this. That same group that does it computed it for Medicaid. Did you ever hear this when people are complaining about the Affordable Care Act? You know what it does? It ramps up the enrollment in Medicaid so dramatically that they're calculating that over 75 years, there's another $17 trillion that has to be added to the national debt. In other words, treating Medicaid the way we treat Medicare and Social Security, you have another $17 trillion. Now, am I saying that we shouldn't be helping the people? Obviously not. But we've got to figure out where we're going as a country. And we've got to at least tell the people the truth that even though this is not, this is a, and by the way, this is a mandatory thing. It's not under contract. It's not funded. But if you look at the principles of budgeting and, and financial reporting of the United States of America, Medicaid, like Social Security and Medicare, is mandatory. And I then said then we should put a, a number on the books for it, $17 trillion, since it's the same thing. Let's keep going. I hope I haven't put anybody to sleep yet. Now, why is accrual accounting good? Well, if you look back and you find out the countries that are on accrual accounting, you find out that they are doing very well. Not because Joe Diaguati says it, and I'm going to skip this slide, because there are governments, New Zealand and Australia, and then the UK and Canada, but I want to show you something. Ah, this is what Stanford University came up with, uh, with the Comptroller General. These numbers do not come from the United States of America or the Treasury Department. These numbers come from IMF, from large economic organizations, and they invented three metrics, fiscal space, fiscal path, and fiscal governance. And they did it in a very common sense, careful way to figure out which countries on a scale of 1 to 34, 34 countries, are good, bad, or poor when it comes to the sovereign fiscal responsibility index. In other words, if you're good, that means that you could keep borrowing. Your budgeting is good, you got good governance, you got space yet to borrow, you know, keep going. And that's where we have Australia and New Zealand. Both on the accrual basis, both rank one and two. Guess what ranks number 34? Greece, it has no more space. Can't borrow anymore, it's bankrupt. But look where we are, I couldn't believe it. We're number 28. Just in front of Ireland, Portugal, we saw Portugal in, in, in the papers last week, one of the banks almost put the whole country under. So we're just in front of Hungary, Ireland, Japan, Iceland, Portugal, and Greece. And by the way, I thought Italy was in bad shape. We're behind Italy. Italy's in front of us. So what does this tell you? These are objective measurements. You can get the study. Go on the Stanford University Public Policy International Studies Program. It was put out. You'll see how they calculated. I don't want to get into the definitions of fiscal, pa fiscal space, fiscal path, path, and fiscal governance, but it all made sense to me. And here it is. Proof positive that the United States, in a ranking from 1 to 34, is number 28. And we're supposed to be the model for the world to follow. We're supposed to be the best superpower in the world. What this doesn't tell you is where we're going. It looks like it's getting worse, not better. OK, conclusions. Why accrual accounting? I don't think I have to tell you that. When you're talking about a complex entity, there is no other system of accounting that will tell you what the financial condition of that entity is and give you the numbers you need to kind of do some interpolations as to where you're going. And by the way, when you're on the accrual method of accounting, guess what else that implies? A capital budget. 37 states in the United States of America have a capital budget. That means we're planning for our, budget, our, our roads, our bridges, uh, infrastructure. Guess what happened last year in the budget of the United States of America? $500 billion of that 
I think it was 3.6 last year, but let's say 500 from 3.7 this year. What's for hard assets? Aircraft carriers, buildings, things that you should capitalize. Guess where it ended up? In the deficit. It automatically goes into the deficit. And what does that tell the people who are working for government on a cash basis? You know what? If I sell that asset next year, I get cash. And on a cash basis, I could put it in for my budget for next year. And believe it or not, when I was a congressman, the military was doing that. Okay? So when are we going to wake up and tell our friends in Congress, you don't have a capital budget? You told me 347 bridges are deficient around America. Now, I know they were not all federal bridges, but we do contribute to help those. But the states, thank God, have a capital budget. All right, the final thing is, why should there be a double standard in the way you count, when I say you count, private sector, I mean SEC imposed accounting on SEC reportable companies. If you have a share of stock yourself or from a, a hedge fund, a mutual fund, you know that those companies that sell those shares have to have accrual accounting. Otherwise, otherwise they'd be indicted for securities fraud. Now, why is that good for us, but not good for the federal government? I have no answer to, for you. The only thing is, we're not loud enough. You're Main Street. You are the people. We, you know, our Constitution starts off not with we the country, or you know, we, we the party, or we the government. It starts off with we the people. Communism had it the other way. We the party, we the state, we the people at the bottom. We have it the other way around. We the people. It's our country. You have to speak up. You are informed citizens. You're accountants. You're people who know the truth. I don't want you to lose your jobs, but there's no reason why you shouldn't be saying some things to your elected representatives. And maybe a little letter to the editor in your local paper. And maybe the local Lions Club or Rotary to say, you know what, we got a bigger problem than you know. And it's just basically accounting. You can't have accountability without a good accounting system. And that's what the, ba the, the basic problem is. Okay, there it is. I just said how you can get around, involved. I'm not going to get into that. But look at one thing. I want you to see HRES 545. Uh, I put it in the booklet. It's there. Read it. It's five pages. I basically drafted it myself. They picked it up. And it may, it's, it's kind of a look back over 60 years, who's been calling for it and why it's important. And there's some other things in there that I didn't say that, that you should read. So basically, conclusions, getting involved, Thomas Jefferson. Look what he wrote to his Secretary of Treasury in 1802. We might hope to see the finances of the Union as clear and intelligible as a merchant's books so that every member of Congress and every man of any mind or woman of any mind in the Union should be able to comprehend them, to investigate abuses, and consequently to control them. 1802. I dare say if we were here today, he would say we need the accrual basis of accounting. Am I right? Okay. Now, if you have any questions, don't be easy on me. Be tough. I believe I've been trained by the best. Having been... Questions okay, will be streamed live, so let me uh, ask the question from uh, that audience. Uh, the first question is, how is it possible that corporations only pay 9% of all revenues? Okay. Now, who's running for office here? That's a political question. <laughs> well, it, it's, it shouldn't be possible, but you know what's happened. We have laws on our books. And I, I was a tax partner, and that's called subpart F of the Internal Revenue Code. If a corporation has operations offshore, they're able to keep those profits offshore and not pay taxes on them until they bring them back to America. And today, it's being questioned. In fact, I just read an article that of the top 10 corporations, seven of them actually do not want to even deal with it because the question comes up, if you had to bring those earnings back, what would be the tax rate that you would pay? Well, three corporations actually computed them anywhere from 25 to 31 percent. The others say, we don't have to answer that question because it's hypothetical and we may never bring them back. We may invest them overseas. 
So if you have a corporation that is multinational, like Apple, like GE, uh, and you take those huge amounts of profits they're making offshore today with China and everything else, you can bring down that tax rate. But how did it get down to 9%? That's even too low. Guess what? They're gaming us. They're moving their corporate headquarters to Ireland, to other states. In fact, Pfizer was in the papers. You heard it. They want to acquire a company that's in one of those safe havens so that it can then merge and then get its tax rate down to maybe 9%. We shouldn't allow them to do that. That's where Congress comes in. There's got to be a law passed to say this is not in the public interest. It's got to stop. But these people have high-paid lobbyists that every day go there. But you're a lobbyist too. You're not high-paid, but you're more important, those lobbyists that are paid. So you've got to let people down there know it's wrong. You can't do that. Okay, very good. Is that a good answer? Very good answer. Okay. <laughs> All right, um, the next question. Accrual accounting is clearly best and will expose liabilities hiding in the closet. However, how do you change our culture's mentality of getting something for nothing from those inappropriately living on public assistance to those wanting their next tax break? Clearly, there's a systematic problem, she said. Right. Well, you know what? We've conditioned the people to think they can get something for nothing. And politicians, I think, I hate to say it, many of them think they get more votes when they bring something home for you, but they don't want to tell you what it costs. But we don't care because, you know, I can just add it to that big pot called the United States of America and that big, you know, treasury bill debt. What's, what, what's another, you know, few hundred thousand for my district? But we have 435 people in the House and 200 in the Senate. And many of them do think that way, that they're more interested in the next election than they are in telling you that we got to change to the accrual basis of accounting. Now, I hate to say it that crassly, but that's what's going on. I'm not running for anything. I could be as honest as, well, even if I ran, I want to be honest, but the point is, it's the truth. People are putting their self-interest on re-election before the interests of the United States of America. That's why I came down to give you this. I hope you understand it and you realize that I have no, nothing to gain except to tell you the truth. And look at my website, and look at all the speeches I've given, articles I've written, and the trips I've made to Congress to tell them they're wrong. You know, it's not that they don't like me, but they don't want to hear me anymore. The um, sustainability report looks at the, the, the deficit, the difference between uh, what is expected to be spent and the revenues under the current law. When you, when you take the um, net present value for the liability, the $70 trillion that you were talking about, isn't that just the, the expenses? It's not discounting the revenues under current law. Well, you're talking there about a calculation that's made on an actuarial basis, 75 years, and then they, add, they, they then reduce it to a present value. Actuaries have to do that. But what you may be referring to is everything else we spend on a 75-year basis, there's another number that you'll see, $4 trillion, and that's the net cost of everything else that's not funded that we have to pay for as well. So if you look at the sustainability numbers, it's in that booklet, it goes from $12 trillion, uh, the total of Medicare and, Medicaid, Medicare and uh, uh, Social Security, uh, $38 trillion, and they add another four for, the, for those other numbers. So basically, it is present value, and it, and it assumes if you're talking about Social Security, it assumes what's being paid in against the benefits, and that interest is calculated, and then it's put on a present value basis. Every actuary has to do it that way. Joe, since a couple people asked about uh, taxes, one of the things that nobody knows about is there was a law passed a number of years ago that when the president's budget comes up on the Hill, the uh, OMB has to have uh, an estimate of uh, taxes that we don't collect because of the types of things you've been talking about. Uh, I have it for last year, and it's over 50 pages of exemptions, deductions, credits, and, and so forth. And you can go on the OMB website and 
uh, take a look at that. Uh, some of them are very controversial. For example, the deductibility of charitable contributions. Uh, most countries uh, limit that to a certain percent of your income. The deductibility of in, uh, interest on mortgages, uh, we've got it down to, you can't have a hundred houses now, but there used to be as many houses, and those are big ones. Uh, the one, the biggest non-taxable income is everybody in this room. Most of us are working, and we get uh, a fringe benefit of uh, either fully subsidized or partially healthcare. subsidized health care. Sure. Well, the crazy thing is that if you're unemployed, you don't get that benefit. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, you're the same thing. You're not paying taxes on a benefit you don't have, just like not paying taxes on a right. benefit uh, that you do right. have. Yeah. So if you want to do some uh, procrastination on uh, what we could do to reduce the tax rates, take a look at that. It'll, it'll wear your printer out if you print out all 50 right. pages of it. But, you know, it goes and it, it starts with the highest in corporate taxes and individual taxes and works down to the smallest. So if you just look at the top ten. No, this is very important. Uh, You're raising an issue that I should have mentioned. We need tax reform like we need blood. Overall tax reform. We shouldn't be tinkering with the tax code. It's got to be made into something that promotes growth. And you're right. If you looked at what you're talking about, they call them tax expenditures, the things that you deduct on your tax return. Besides the $3.7 trillion of money we're actually spending, and some we don't have, we have to borrow, there's another $1.3 or $4 trillion in these taxable expenditures. What are they? Mortgage interest deduction. I'm not saying to get rid of it. Uh, charitable contributions, um, shelters for real estate, anywhere that there's a kind of preferential treatment for something because somebody had a good lobbyist and they put it in there, there's one, I'll tell you right now, has to go, the carried interest. Hey, if I'm a hedge fund person and I'm working for a living, earned income, why am I given the privilege of having all my income taxed at 15% last year, that was capital gains, now it's 20%, and not the top rate, which I think is 37, 39%. That's one that's got to change. That's one of the ones that got Mitt Romney in trouble. He's a multimillionaire because he was into one of those. But there are a lot of people living on Park Avenue, New York, that are in that business on Wall Street, hedge funds, uh, municipal funds, uh, mutual funds, and they're being taxed at a very preferential rate. It's got to change. You know why it's got to change? We don't want to, it's not because we want to hurt them per se. It's not fair to the rest of America. And we're on a self-assessment system. If people think that you're getting away with something and they're, and they're not getting, they might say, well, why should we pay our taxes? So it's important to go back and make the tax code as fair as possible so we collect as much taxes as possible. And I hope they're going to do that this soon. This is uh, really easy. Is there a PowerPoint presentation available on your website that can be used when speaking to public organizations? Well, we'll I think this is on, but if it's not, it will be put on as soon as uh, we go back. Okay. Because I want you to have it. And I want you to, you and know. The last question is, is, is it true that we perform a cool budgetary accounting, but we only show cash to the public? Okay. No, it's not. First of all, let me tell you something. When I talk about accrual accounting, I'm talking about the budget as well as financial statements. You know that the budget is controlled by law. No one could change the budget from cash to accrual until Congress decides it wants to do it. But I don't, I've, I don't think there's anybody in Congress in appropriations that has a number for accrual accounting when they appropriate the cash. But what you may be talking about is the fact that when you look at the financial statements of the United States of America, at the end of the year, they put it on what they call a modified cash accrual basis. So they are recomputing. So what I told you about in terms of the assets, uh, capital budgets, yes, they make a calculation that puts those assets back on, depreciates them to come up with something close to accrual accounting. But it's not enough. Okay. So this is our session. I, I just want to say to the audience, you should feel like Oprah because you all got a book to carry home. You got a gift. And yeah. I do want to thank uh, our former, former 
Congressman oh, thank you. Joseph Diawadi for his presentation, and there will be a, a donation made to a charity on behalf of his presentation. So thank you all for attending. Thank you. And let's give him a hand. Thank you. Beautiful.